The APUs are here. And I'm not talking about Nahama Pisa Petalon. That was a Simpsons joke. Never mind. This right here hits the threshold for APUs. In the past, APUs were a trade off. Weaker core performance for an integrated GPU. Okay, yeah, that's fine. It's a part aimed at lower cost systems. You know, not every desktop computer necessarily needs more than what built in graphics can offer. In the past, you had Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 APUs, typically four core, but now we have the Ryzen 7 5700G and the Ryzen 5 5600G. These are more desktop class processors than ever before. Six and eight cores in an APU, boosting up to 4.6 gigahertz for the eight core and 4.4 gigahertz for the six core. But in the box that you get, you get a modest cooler as well. Remember, these are 65 watt parts after all, so don't be too alarmed by the small stature, the modest size of that cooler. Uh, 65 watts, eight core, this kind of cooler for an eight core? Well, I mean, if you don't overclock, it's 65 watts, barely yes. Our test systems are based on the ASRock Tai Chi X570 and the ASUS Strix B550E motherboards. Both systems are outfitted with dual channel, dual rank, G-Skill Trident Z 3600CL16 memory. Out of the box, the Cinebench scores are pretty impressive here. Let's just get right to it. The uh, 582, yeah, that's the 5700G. And it's perhaps closer to the 5800X than you might realize. 5800X is around 620, 624, compared to 581 on the 5700G and 556 on the 5600G. Now, that's no doubt because of the, you know, up to 4.6 gigahertz boost clock of the 5700G, which is within striking distance of the 5800X. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. These, these APUs are within five to 10% of their desktop counterparts. And they're actually six and eight cores? What? Yes, that's the move to Zen 3. That gets you the big 19% IPC uplift that we discussed you know, last year when the big Zen 3 CPUs launched, things like the 5950X. Everything is wholly unlike the 3000 series AMD APUs. And I can't drive this point home enough. These APUs are so much better that it's, it's uncanny. Six and eight cores, mid-range desktop, level performance out of those six and eight cores. There's no compromises here. They're so fast, there's minimal bottlenecking. Even if you shove a high-end GPU in there, something like the 6900 XT, I've got the, the ASRock 6900 XT, we're gonna take a look at that in a minute. I mean, sure, technically there's also the 4000 series APUs, and I imported and reviewed a 4750G for home labbing and doing that kind of stuff, and it's great. But not many people saw these systems because they were really for OEMs like HP and Lenovo, and they were really meant for inexpensive desktop class computers. So you didn't really see them in the DIY market. Well, these, these are DIY. And the artificial benchmarks of these CPUs in Firestrike and PC Mark and everything else show that these chips are pretty great. Anyway, the built-in Vega is an eight CU with one meg of L2 cache, two gigahertz on the R7 version, seven CUs and 1.9 gigahertz on the R5. Otherwise, there's 16 megs of shared L3 cache for your six or eight cores, depending on what model you opt for. There's also full PCIe 3.0 connectivity, 24 lanes, 16 for peripherals, four for the NVMe, and four to the chipset. So if you use that X570 motherboard you got, you get the full features of X570. Just remember PCIe 3, not four, to the chipset, so that's only half bandwidth. But that's a reasonable trade-off, in my opinion. Let's look at the games first, shall we? Uh, before we get to the fun stuff. All right, look at that. And this is an APU that can easily deliver over 80 FPS in 1080p in Grand Theft Auto V. Now you can dial up the graphics fidelity a little bit and still manage 60 FPS at 1080p in this title. Now, GTA V, it's an older game. <laughs> it's an older code, but it checks out, sir. Uh, it still has tons of players. It still makes a lot of money. Pretty much all the esports titles ran really well, shockingly well, just like that. I mean, this is Vega... You know, seven and eight, but I guess the clock bump and Zen three cores really makes a huge difference here, depending on what AAA title that you're looking at. I mean, uh, you know, if you're a 60 FPS gamer, you can game at 720p. You're nearly 60 FPS at 720p in pretty much all the scenarios with a lot of games, Dirt 5, Deus Ex, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Those games could easily manage 30 to 40 FPS at 1080p, which, you know, that's pretty playable. 
that's, you know, console-ish playable. And other games like Anno, Civ 6, strategy games, those games were much better off at 1080p and much closer to 60 FPS at 1080p. What about the competition? What about Team Blue? Okay, okay. They, you know, 11th gen revamped graphics, they're pretty good too, right? On, on Team Blue? Well, the 11700 is around half as fast as the APUs here. And I'm sure other channels are going to do benchmarks on that in particular. But esports in general, pretty much everything was like that. Fortnite in particular, 40 FPS on the i5-11600. And consistently between 85 and 100 FPS on these APUs. Now that isn't low, keep in mind, but still, that's really impressive. Now come with me for a second. There's something far more interesting than that. Okay, suppose you buy the APUs now for 1080p gaming, 720p gaming, medium low on AAA titles and medium high on esports titles. And then, at some point later, when you can actually buy them, you get a GPU, a discrete GPU. If you opted for the competing APUs from Team Blue and suffered through that, at half the frame rate, how much better would you be off now adding a discrete GPU? Because, you know, those cores are a little faster, right? Well, the Intel CPUs have also been a little cheaper in the market than their AMD counterparts, so maybe you would do that. And if you went crazy with the highest end GPU, like our ASRock 6900 XT, with your 300-ish dollar CPU, what would you be looking at performance-wise? You'd be better off with Team Blue, right? I mean, that's the conventional wisdom. Well, the biggest gap you'd see would be in games like Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, ranked about 180 FPS on Team Blue versus about 167 on Team Red. But that's on 1080p with the 6900 XT. Did you really buy a 6900 XT to play 1080p games? If we bump the resolution up to 4K, there's basically no difference. Other games like Sid Meier's Civ 6 saw virtually no performance difference on the 6900 XT, running around 179 FPS with discrete high-end, uh, you know, graphics in that GPU on either Team Red or Team Blue. Okay, so the 5700G is 8 cores. What if you've been able to get a 5800X and a GPU from the start? How's this thing look as a 5700G plus GPU bought later versus a 5800X and the same GPU bought right now? Well, first off, the 5800X costs a little bit more, but it's also a higher TDP part. You know, it's 8 cores and 8 cores, but it's 65 watts versus you know, 105-ish watts, 100 watts, 95 watts, however how you want to look at that. And what if you overclock the 5700G? Well, moving up and just letting PBO do its thing, which is really a sort of bump to 95 watts from 65 watts. And yes, you will need an upgraded cooler. This thing, it ain't going to do it. Uh, we used a Be Quiet Pure Loop 360, and that worked well. That took us up to 97.5 FPS on low medium in Fortnite, and a solid 60 FPS. PS at 1440p. That's before we add the GPU. Deus Ex, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, etc, etc, they all had similar performance bumps. Okay, now let's add in the GPU. What about the 5800X with the GPU versus the 5700G with the, the GPU? Well, AM4 makes this kind of testing possible because we're using the same motherboards for all of this. The 5800X it has a higher clock speed, which helps the higher frame rate gaming, you know, when we're talking about 1080p, but in this territory, you're probably targeting like over 100 FPS, so you go 1440p. Or if you've got a GPU like the 6700 XT or a 6800, you're not going to be seeing as much of a difference there because the GPU is where your, your bottleneck is. Don't forget us Linux users! All oh, right, yeah, Linux users and off-label uses, right. So ECC is supported but unqualified as per usual from AMD. There are pro versions of these CPUs where ECC maybe has been qualified. That's a whole other conversation. I tried ECC in the Tai Chi X570. Seems to be working. Now I gotta interrupt me for a second because on the ECC front, things are a little weird. I imported the 4750G, the previous generation APU. It wasn't widely available, I know, I know. It's great for server stuff. It's great in the server issue AM4 motherboards that have things like IPMI. ECC is supported and worked great. It's pro. AMD says that ECC will work on these 5000 series APUs, but it's up to the motherboard vendors. The ASRock Taichi X570 that I've tested ECC on before, with the BIOS updates to drive it, don't seem to have the ECC options. I've reached out to ASRock for more information. I also asked AMD, is like, hey, do you know of any motherboards that support ECC out of the box? Waiting to hear back. It's going to be another video. We're going to do another video on home lab stuff for these APUs because gosh darn it, I love it on the 4000 series APUs. It really is incredible. ECC will work. It's just a matter of getting the right combinations. 
or making the noise to get the motherboard vendors to add the toggleables in the BIOS so that we can see that it's working. The Linux kernel was not able to detect that ECC was on as far as I could tell. Uh, booting on the X570. I also tested the Asus Crosshair Hero 8. So I'm not sure if that's a Linux kernel thing or whatever. Stay tuned. There's going to be more content on ECC on these APUs. But otherwise, you know, all the Linux stuff was completely fine. So what are the downsides? What are the oddities that you encountered? Well, in testing, my 0.1% lows and 1% lows improved on a number of games more than I expected when I enabled more reserve memory for the APU. Remember the guidance from AMD was that auto is just fine. This is the UMA setting in BIOS. And it didn't really affect the average frame rates, but things like Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Fortnite, the stutter was noticeably less, although it was intermittent. So, eh, versus auto. If you get 16 gigs or more of memory, it may be worth trying to set two or four gigabytes of reserve memory in the UMA setting, just to see what happens. Maybe your 1% lows bother you, maybe you get intermittent stutters. Try turning that on and see what happens. And remember, these, PC, these you know, APUs are PCIe 3, so that chipset length is also PCI Express 3. So if you've got X570 and you're planning on building a home server thing, and you've got a lot of peripherals you're gonna hang off that X570 chipset, just remember you might not have as much bandwidth as you think you do, from the X570 to the CPU. It's only PCI Express 3.0 by 4, not PCI Express 4. Also, DDR4-3200 is the max supported speed. If you're gonna go 128 gigs of memory for like a home server, it's gonna drop down to 2933. And that's because you've got, you know, basically quad rank per channel in 128 gigs, and your maximum supported memory speed is 2933. So keep that in mind. I think that's fine, but keep that in mind. And when overclocking, there can still be edge cases where the system doesn't know whether it should prioritize giving extra power to the CPU or the GPU. They're both working from the same power budget, basically. And that's also related to why I recommend leaving the power state in balanced rather than high performance in Windows. Because in balanced, the performance governors can just sort of do what they need to do. In high performance, it disables power management and C states, which means that your idle CPU could be stealing power away that could be used for the GPU. I mean, an APU is not gonna replace a discrete GPU in terms of how good the experience is. But an APU this good, at this price point, you know, 359 suggested end user pricing for the eight core and 259 for the six core, that's pretty good. And considering that they're basically at parity with their desktop counterparts, a little worse, uh, it seems like a no brainer, especially in this sort of scenario. It's like if you can't buy a GPU and you still want a game at 1080p, getting an APU, it doesn't hurt you later. You get within 10% of the performance of a 5800X for an eight core, and that's pretty darn good. You can play eSports titles, you can play strategy games, you can do okay, depending on if you want 720p or 1080p. That's a really, really good situation to be in. The only thing AMD could have done better is to come out with these sooner because the shortages are real, and if these aren't affected as much by the shortages, or maybe we're at the tail end of the GPU shortage now, which maybe changes things a little bit. I don't know. I kind of, I'm sort of predicting that because these APUs are so good, it's gonna eat away the market for lower end GPUs. You know, it, would you buy a really low end GPU? Like if the, you know, like the RX 540, you know, was coming out today, would it make sense? And I think the answer is no. Will there be a you know $150 GPU that's on par with you know what was the RX 550 or 560 or 570? I don't know, um, but it seems like the the APU being as good as it is sort of takes away from the the low end market and there ends up being more of a gap between no GPU performance and GPU performance because you'll at least want you know, 200 FPS at 1080p if you're going to shell out and get a GPU as expensive as GPUs are. So it's a really interesting dynamic right now in terms of manufacturing availability and everything else. Uh, personally, I think AMD has hit it out of the park with these APUs. The performance is incredible. Uh, the gaming experience is incredible. 65 watts is a pretty good target. You can use these low power systems, desktop systems. They work really well when you <laughs> give them another 30 watts. So they seem to know what to be able to do with that, which is pretty awesome for the DIY scene. And for home labbing, you know, if you want to run one of these APUs with uh, <laughs> eight cores and 128 gigs of memory, and you've got the full 16 PCI Express lanes. I mention that because not everybody realizes if you're looking at like the old 3000 series APUs, 
Um, you know, those would use some of the PCIe lanes for the Vega connection. So you'd only get like eight PCIe lanes out of those old APUs. But this is full fat. It's PCIe Express 3.0, but you get the NVMe lanes. It's way easier on motherboard manufacturers to route that and deal with that. It is uh, awesome for a home lab, if eight cores will do it for you in a home lab. Low power, 65 watts. A lot of people look for that in a home lab. So yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting times. I'm Wendell, this is level one. This has been a quick look at the new APUs from, from AMD. We're gonna do a home lab build. I've actually already started on it. It's the IC Doc system um, that I reviewed before. It's got 24 SATA drives in it and a bunch of CD-ROMs. Uh, be sure to get subscribed if you wanna check that out and stay tuned for that. But yeah, eight core APUs, doing the home server, the home media rip thing. That's what we're doing. I'm Wendell, this is level one. I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. If you have any questions or a use case or something you want me to test, that I missed, hey, by all means, love to talk to you. See you there.